Well, the people have spoken. I put up a poll asking what kind of videos you wanted to see next, and Master at Arms videos were overwhelmingly what won, so here are the ranks of the Navy Security Forces. Now I know what you're thinking, like aren't Master at Arms ranks the same as every other rating? And the answer is, not all of them are the same. For Corman it's different, for MA it's different, and I'm gonna explain why. As we go through them, I'm gonna go through every single rank, what the rank is, what you'll do when you reach that rank, how they interact with you after you join, how to address them, and even how long it'll take you to get to that rank. So imagine you just joined the Navy as an E1. E1 is the first rate of the Navy, and that's your DOD pay grade. A lot of people confuse rate, rank, and rating, especially when they're filling out paperwork and it says in a box like rate slash rank. Think of it the same way as male slash female or single slash married. It's asking you which one. Rank or rate. Male or female, single or married. I remember in A school one time they handed out papers to everybody and it had a box and it said put down your rate and everybody put down MA. And they had to take all the papers and throw them away and hand out new ones so everybody can put down E1, E2, E3 because it was asking for their rate, not their rating. They're like, we know your MAs. You know, this is called MAA school. We're asking for your rate, not your rating. For the Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps, the term rank goes for every single spot, every pay grade from E1 all the way to O10. But for the Navy and Coast Guard, only officers have rank. So like O1 through O10 are ranks, and E1 through E9 is all rates. So that explains the difference between rank and rate, but then there are also ratings. The rating system for the Navy and Coast Guard is the same as the MOS system for the Army and Marine Corps and Air Force. It's what job you have. So when you first join the Navy, you have the rate of E1, which is seaman recruit, but you have no rank because you're not an officer, and you have no rating because you haven't completed A school yet. Now it is possible to join the Navy as an E2 or an E3, but how to do that has already been explained multiple times on this channel, so it's redundant to cover it again. So after you join, you're gonna be E1, E2, or E3, Seaman Recruit, SR, Seaman Apprentice, SA, or Seaman, SN, until you graduate A school. At that point, you finally have a rate and a rating. It's kind of like a math problem where they put it together, and it's Master at Arms, Seaman Recruit, Master at Arms, Seaman Apprentice, and Master at Arms, Seaman. Now in the old days, in order to make E4, you had to pass the advancement exam, which is literally a test, testing your knowledge on your rating in order to get promoted or you had to get mapped to make E4, and they got rid of both of those things with the sickness of 2020. You still have to worry about the exam and being mapped to get to E5 and above, but for E4, they're gone. Now you probably noticed that I put E1 through E4 all into one lumped up category, and there's a good reason for that. It's because for Master at Arms, that's basically the junior sailor category. There are all the people that man all the posts around the base, and it's really only a difference of experience by a little bit from E1 all the way through E4 in most cases. Once you get to E4, you start to see a real difference of how people take their career from that point because up until then, you're only responsible for yourself and it doesn't really matter if you just go to work, do your job, and then go home. But some E4s are kind of comfortable there. They just kind of stay around. They still do the same thing as an E2 would where they come to work, do their job, and go home. And you see other people that are grinding, they're doing volunteer opportunities, they're helping to teach people English off base, they're doing all kinds of different things, and they're really, really trying to make E5, which you can't just wait to get like you could for E1 through E4. For E5, like I said earlier, you had to pass that exam or get selected by your command to get promoted. So some people really grind hard to get it early. At the same time, you see a bunch of people that are E4s, and they're sometimes on their second and third command, and they don't really care to be promoted. They just want to relax and not take on responsibilities. Not everybody wants to be responsible for 10 other people. Not everybody wants to be in command of a post or something. They just want to still be like a junior person that comes to work and goes home. And you know that person eventually is just going to be overrun, passed up in the race by somebody that's trying really hard to get promoted. And they're going to get it, and the other person's not. Now E1s through E4s, generally speaking, are the people just manning the posts around the base or the ship or wherever you are. And E4 is where it begins, where you can actually take on a leadership role, like being in charge of a post or a team of people and stuff like that. If something happens on a post, 
You might be the person in charge of that post that tells people what to do, where to go, how to think, all that stuff. And it can make a big difference on the resolution of that situation based on what you're doing. E3s and below can get the same qualifications as anybody, but an E4 and above is more likely to actually stand that post instead of just hold a piece of paper that says they're qualified to do it, but never get a chance to actually do it. Now, generally speaking, from E1 to E4, nobody's going to call you by your rate. Nobody's going to say, hey, MASA, MA3, unless they're a boot or something. They're going to call you by your name still. Like, hey, Smith, hey, Beck, get over here. You know, that's just the way it is. But once you get to E5, things change a lot. It takes one year minimum to go from E4 to E5. And again, you have to go by the exam or being mapped. And that's how it is. Once you finally get to E5, you're an MA2, Master at Arms, second class. And it's a big jump from E1 through E4 to E5 because now you're allowed to live off base. There's a pay increase. There's a respect increase. It's the first rate where they call you by MA2 instead of just by your name, which is an acknowledgement of your responsibilities, your experience and everything. And you've proven yourself that you're capable of leadership positions and all that stuff. It is a huge deal to finally get from the lower ranks to E5. It takes people on average about four, four and a half years to go from when they joined to E5. And it's really competitive. A lot of people try to get it, strive for it. They get it through different methods. They either, you know, get mapped or the exam, like I mentioned earlier. And because your package for being mapped is being compared against other people, some people go way over the top. They go get qualifications from different departments like AT and Harbor and other stuff and it's all gonna be compared, and a few people are gonna be selected to be mapped. And then to study for the exam, it's also a long process, and you know it can be really daunting, but people get it, people pass it, and once you get it, you made it. Generally speaking, as a second class, you should have been to multiple commands already at this point. You have a lot of experience under your belt, maybe even different types of command, like law enforcement, a ship, PRP, different things. And people are gonna to come to you for advice, come to you for mentorship, and they're going to assume just because they see that little patch on your chest that you know what you're doing, you're a leader, and that you're somebody that they can look up to. At this point, taking a leadership role is no longer optional. It's pretty much expected from the first classes and the chiefs. You should be a role model for the people that you're looking after. As a second class, you can still be seen manning the regular posts around the base, but you can also be called up to oversee the entire base's security for the day. You can also check on posts randomly and make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing and not doing what they're not supposed to be doing. If something crazy happens, it's the first classes and the second classes that are directing everything and passing down orders that are meant to be implemented by the third classes and the junior sailors at their respective posts. The chain of command for Master at Arms is pretty similar to other ratings where chiefs pass down what the officers say and the first classes pass it down to the second classes and the second classes pass it down to the junior sailors. It's inappropriate for someone that's E1 through E4 to go directly to a first class with a problem they have. Unless it's like a special circumstance, they should go directly to a second class, not a first class. Second classes are the ones that handle a lot of things that first classes and chiefs should not be bothered with. Just like with the third classes, there are second classes that get comfortable being there, they rest on their laurels, and they don't work that hard to become a first class. And that's gonna create a big opportunity for people like you to grind, to get there and get first class, maybe even on their first try. It's at least a three year period from picking up second to picking up first. By the way, this video took a long time to make. I make them by myself. I'm providing you this information for free. The only thing I ask for in return is to hit the like button and subscribe. It helps out a lot and I really appreciate it. E6 is Master at Arms first class and they're the ones that pass down whatever the chiefs say and are well known for giving the best speeches to duty sections. No, but seriously, they do stand some of the most important watches and they are absolutely vital to the security of any installation or ship. Now, once you make first class, it's officially the big leagues. You're way up there in the chain of command. People that are E4 and below aren't gonna bother you no more, but you have new problems to deal with. You're dealing with managing an entire section of security forces. They also take care of a lot of administrative work. They handle, you know, PRTs, evals, fitness stuff, medical records, all kinds of stuff that happens behind the scenes. The MA1s, the first classes are the ones that take care of that. Being a first class is probably the most stressful job on this list. 
especially if you have a really large duty section because everything just falls on your shoulders while you're watching over dozens and dozens of people. People joke and people kid, but there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes. For example, if you're a first class, you can't just come to a new command and be watch commander right away. You have to earn the qualifications just like everybody else. When you're a first class, you're gonna be addressed by everybody as MA1, including by the second classes. And at this point, you're kind of on a cloud above the ground. People that are E4 and below aren't gonna bother you anymore, or at least they're not supposed to. You're gonna be dealing with chiefs and above, and you're gonna be dealing with second classes that are passing up things that are happening with the juniors. It takes people on average about six to 10 years to go from second class to first class, but some people get it later and that's okay. After three years serving as a first class, you can go up for chief, but it's well known to be a very, very difficult process to get selected. And even if you are selected, it's a whole transitional process. Suffice it to say, if you are selected based on the package you submit with all your accomplishments and records and everything on it, you get referred to from that point forward as chief select. After a whole transitional period as a chief select, you go through a bunch of different events and you finally get pinned with the rate of chief. They put the cover on your head and you're officially now an E7 chief. Well, it's been a very long career, but you finally made it to chief. I've asked several of them how long it took them to get there and it seemed like the average answer was about 10 to 12 years. So I've asked some first classes and chiefs around me some questions they might not be used to hearing, like was it worth it and would you do it again? And all of them have said yes, with the exception of one. And he said, he smiled and he's like, no, I would not do it again. It wasn't worth it. And I appreciate his honesty. I'm not going to put his name out there, but he's a good man. <laughs> Whenever you're looking at a career path that you're considering, you want to see how happy and satisfied the people are that have already been where you're looking to go. And if they are happy, you want to see how they did it and use that as a template for your own life and your own career. Ask yourself if the end result is worth it. And if the answer is no, there's no point in wasting your time. Move on to something else. Now, once you're a chief, you made it. Chiefs are a really big deal in the Navy, much more so than E7s and other branches. They pass down what the E8s and above say and what the officers and the command says down to the junior sailors. At this point, you're pretty much larger than life to anybody that's E3 and below. And everybody, including the first classes, is going to call you Chief, even though the abbreviation for Chief Master at Arms is MAC, that only shows up on paper. Everybody's going to call you Chief from E1 all the way to E6. Generally speaking, I found that Chiefs and above, E7 and above, through the officer ranks, are a lot more chill and relaxed than E6s and below, because at this point, you got nothing left to prove. You made it. So at this point, if you're a senior chief or a master chief or higher, you're handling the administrative work for the entire command and answering directly to officers. Junior sailors know your rate and your name, but they're probably rarely ever going to see you unless you go somewhere on your own accord. If you're an E8, you're addressed as senior chief, but it's also okay to call them senior. Don't ever call a senior chief a chief because it's really insulting and it disregards how hard it is to go from chief to senior chief but it's also really difficult to see that little quarter inch star on their patch. Once you're known by face and by name, there's less and less of a risk of accidentally being called chief instead of senior chief, but it happens unintentionally all the time because it's hard to see the patch. I had the idea of like a chief being a silver anchor and a senior chief being a gold anchor, and that would make it a lot easier to prevent this from happening and to identify the rate from far away, but it's probably never gonna happen and there's a history behind the anchor being a gold fouled anchor, so it's probably never gonna happen, but it would be a reasonable solution if it ever did happen. So anyways, it's a minimum of three years to go from MA1 to chief, and it's also a three year minimum to go from chief to senior chief, but it's probably gonna take a lot longer than that because it's a really difficult and really selective process. It's also three years minimum to go from senior chief to master chief, but realistically speaking, you're looking at like 15 to 25 years in the Navy to get to that level, and maybe even more. After that many years in the Navy, you're making thousands and thousands of dollars a month base pay, and you don't have to stand watches anymore. You're just doing administrative work on behalf of the command. The dichotomy between now and when you first joined is unbelievable. So anyways, if you're a Master Chief, you're going to be addressed as Master Chief. They can't call you Master for short, like good morning, Master. That'd be really weird. But 
Master Chief is Master Chief, and that's how you address them. Now, theoretically, it's possible for there to be a Force Master Chief, a Fleet Master Chief, or higher. That's a Master at Arms, but I've never seen it on paper, online, or in person, with one exception. The Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy is one of the highest rates of the Navy, and there has been one that was a Master at Arms, but that's a topic for a different day. That was a long time ago. Now, maybe you don't want to wait 25 years to become a Master Chief. Maybe you want to go straight to the officer route. Well, there are several ways to do that. For one thing, for Master at Arms, you can't come straight into Ensign from the civilian world. You have to start as an enlisted person and then become an officer. For other jobs like surface warfare, it's possible for someone to graduate university, walk onto a ship or a base with only basic officer training and no real world experience. And that person, on paper at least, outranks people that have been in the Navy for 25 to 30 years. But as a Master at Arms officer, all of them are previous enlisted. That gives every Master at Arms officer a more fulfilling experience because to them it's not just theories and textbooks. They can look back on their own enlisted service, what they liked about the job, what they didn't like, and put that into perspective and implement controls based on that experience. Now a lot of the current senior Master at Arms officers are people that actually came from different ratings like Signalman, which isn't even an independent rating anymore. But after 9-11, the rating was opened up and a lot of people transferred over from other ratings. In order to become a Master at Arms officer now, you need to be prior enlisted as an MA. There are several ways to become an officer which is referred to as being commissioned. One way to get commissioned is the State 21 program, Seaman to Admiral 21 program, where you go to college while you're still active duty and then you can transfer over, get commissioned, and you're an ensign. Another option for you is to go to the reserves, go to college full time, and then go to OCS from the reserves back to active duty to serve as an officer. Another option is the limited duty officer program where you need to be at least a first class and have at least eight years of service. You can put in a package and if you're selected, you go to Mustang school. If you're prior enlisted and become an officer, you're referred to as a Mustang. Sometimes you even see prior enlisted officers and they have a belt buckle with a Mustang on it. There are other ways too, but that's not a bad quick summary. By the way, since every Master at Arms officer is prior enlisted, you oftentimes still see them wearing the silver warfare badges from their enlisted days. Officers can get the same warfare devices as enlisted people, but the officer ones are gold and the enlisted ones are silver. It is possible for officers to upgrade from the silver ones to the gold ones, but some of them never really upgrade. They keep the silver ones on their officer uniforms instead of the gold ones to kind of have an I've been there and done that kind of look, I guess. So besides the full commissioned officers, there are also warrant officers, but they're really, really rare to see. I've personally never seen one in person that's a master at arms, but I guess they do exist. If you don't know what a warrant officer is, it's essentially a subject expert. So anyways, the first commissioned officer rank for master at arms and for frankly the entire Navy, O1, is going to be ensign. And if you're a master at arms ensign, you're basically handling a lot of the administrative work on a low level for the command and for the sections, and you aren't really seen a lot by junior sailors. Junior sailors are going to know your name and your rank because you're in their chain of command, but you don't really have to be anywhere and see the junior sailors unless you go there on your own accord, similar to like the chiefs and higher for enlisted people. For O2 through O5, that's lieutenant junior grade, lieutenant, lieutenant commander and commander, you're either going to be in command of an entire bases or ship security apparatus or the assistant to that person. If you're any kind of enlisted person from E1 all the way to E9 and you see anybody from O1 all the way to O10, which is any kind of officer, you just refer to them as sir in person or ma'am if it's a female. Sir or ma'am, you don't say lieutenant or ensign or admiral or anything like that. You just say sir or ma'am. For O6, captain, which is equivalent to an Army, Air Force, Marine Corps colonel, you can probably count the number of them on one single hand. They are extremely rare to see and usually have been in the Navy about 30 to 40 years at this point. Remember that all these officers have to be prior enlisted. So say you joined as an E1 and you made it all the way to first class or chief after 15 years. Then you have to go back down to O1, which is technically a step up, and go all the way up the ranks to captain, O6. That's another 15 or 20 years. You're talking about like 30 to 40 years in the Navy to get to this level as an MA. It's literally like having two careers in one single life. 
I've only met one master at arms captain so far. He was in my A school graduation and besides that, I've only seen a picture of one or two more online. At this point, if you're a master at arms captain, you're in charge of security at the highest level and the person in command of all of naval security forces is an MA captain. As far as I know, there are no master at arms admirals, so the entire ranking structure stops at this point. So that's the story. I hope you enjoyed this and stay tuned for more.